All right, everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Casey Carter. I'm with Microsoft. I also happen to be the project editor for the Ranges TS right now on this Deep Plus Standards Committee. I'm here today to talk about Iterator Haiku, which is a pretty name for a design change that occurred in the Ranges TS, where we took the C++ standards five iterator categories and expanded them into seven iterator categories to be able to describe more problems, and then found a flaw in our design and in the process of correcting it, turned the seven iterator categories back into five again without being able to, uh, without reducing the descriptivity of the system. So uh, overview of the talk. First about questions, if anybody has questions, just raise your hand, make yourself known. I'll interrupt the talk for questions because I'm trying to stay very high level, which means I'm occasionally gonna skim over some details and probably miss out things that people need to understand. I've got a, a lot of ground to cover, so I'm not gonna go too deep here. I've gotta make sure you guys have enough background to understand the design issues that I'm talking about is the, the point of the talk. So we're gonna talk a little bit about ranges and iterators in standard C++. And we're gonna talk about how the Palo Alto tech report changed that. Oh, I'm also gonna tell you guys what that is, since most of you aren't members of the C++ standards committee, you probably haven't heard of it before. And then I'm gonna talk about how ranges and iterators evolved in the ranges TS itself. There are uh, uh, some design flaws with the design concept that show up as strange issues with how the, the concepts are applied to the iterators. And I'm gonna talk about how I decided to investigate those by uh, re and how it found a, a horrible flaw in the design that it was internally inconsistent. There was a contradiction in our design and we had to fix it. First of all, ranges in standard C++. Why do we need ranges TS if there are already ranges in the standard? The, the answer is I have a family to feed. So it's important that I be paid to do something and I'd rather be paid to work on ranges than to dig ditches. But um, realistically speaking, the standard has two different kinds of ranges, right? So why do we need more ranges than that? The fact is that the ranges in the standard, although they exist, they're not very well defined and they don't quite cover as much ground as we'd like them to. We can't get our hands wrapped around them and write lots of new kinds of ranges. They're not well specified. They don't have strong semantics. So the first kind of idea for what, what exists as a range in standard C++. Ranges are sequences of elements that are, that are between two iterators, right? I call this a, the range sequence notion so we can keep it separate from the other notion of a range. We like to overload terms in C++, right? The more different meanings you have for a term, the better job you're doing. These kinds of ranges are often denoted with a, an interval notation as a iterator pair, an iterator i, and an iterator k. The range of elements is everything from i up to, but not including the element or not element if it's past the end, denoted by k. The interval notation implicitly requires reachability. Right? It's defined in the standard that this notation means that some number of increments applied to i will result in the value of well, k, right? That this is a finite interval. It's guaranteed it has to happen. Uh, essentially, the uh, quality operator is an end of sequence test that we can apply to these two things in the interval. We can test i to see if it's equal to k, and that means that we've reached the end of the sequence. Our other notion of ranges in the standard is a range object. This means, you know, things that you can plug into range based four. They must be ranges because the word range is right there in the name, range based four. And the interesting fact about these kinds of range object things is that we can apply begin and end to them and get iterators back and get ta -da, a range of the first kind, right? A range sequence. Range base four converts range objects into range sequences so that our two kinds of ranges actually end up being one kind of range and can do the same sorts of things. All right, I said ranges are denoted by iterators, so we have to at least briefly talk about what are iterators. There are five different categories of iterators in standard C++. The first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, input. Input iterators have several different operations. All right, there's a, you can take star of an input iterator to read its value, you can dereference it as if it was a pointer. Plus plus advances the input iterator to the next element in the sequence. 
equals, I can use to test two iterator values to see if they denote the same element in the sequence, or I can test an iterator with the end iterator of a sequence to see if I've gotten to the end, right? We use the same syntax for both of those operations. Not equals is obviously the complement of equality, right? If they're not equals, then equals would return false, not equal would return two. These kinds of iterators are single pass. I can only go through a sequence once with input iterators. I can't go back to a value that I saw before, and they are obviously readable. I already said that, but that's a very important point here that we can get the value of the elements out of the sequence using an input iterator. The fact that they're required to be readable doesn't mean that they're not necessarily writable. I might have a writable input iterator that's single pass and that I can read and write the iterator, the values of, they might be mutable. The classic example I have up here for this is uh, an iStream iterator that you may be familiar with if you've written C++ programs before. I can use an iStream iterator to iterate over a range of values in an input stream. Next up, forward iterators. Forward iterators are a refinement of iter input iterators, which means everything I can do with an input iterator, I can do with a forward iterator, but it has an additional characteristic, which is that forward iterators are multi-pass. If I keep an old iterator value around, I can start over from that point again in the sequence and pass over the sequence multiple times. A classic example we have here for this is the iterators over a forward list. A forward list is singly linked. We're all relatively familiar with it if we've written programs. I can iterate over a forward list several times. I can compare the iterators for equality just like I could with input iterators. They are always readable, sometimes writable, just like with input iterators. The key difference here is that they're multipaths. Bidirectional iterators have all the properties of forward iterators, plus they can be decremented, right? We can move them backwards through the sequence as well as forwards. The example for this is a doubly linked list. With a doubly linked list, I can move forward through the list, I can move backward through the list. It's a bidirectional iterator. Random access iterators are the mo most powerful kind of iterator we have in standard C++. I can do all sorts of interesting things with them that I couldn't do with the other kinds. They are almost pointers, right? I can add constant offsets to them to move to a random point in the sequence in constant time, which would take me linear time with a forward iterator. I'd have to increment over and over again instead of being able to jump 10 steps at once. Uh, the example here is iter vector iterators. We're all familiar with vector iterators because vector is our favorite thing. Uh, I can sort random access iterators, right? Things that require me to jump around in the sequence to multiple places quickly are the kinds of algorithms that can be written with random access iterators. Last but not least, we have output. Output is sort of the redheaded stepchild of the C++ iterator categories. Output is an iterator that's required to be mutable, but not required to be readable. In that sense, people like to think it's the opposite of input, but it isn't really, because an input iterator could be readable and writable. All of the other kinds of iterators that are required to be readable could still be writable. This is the class that's left for iterators that don't fit any of the readable categories, right? If they don't fit any of the readable categories, and they're write only, they are output iterators. These are also single pass, just like input iterators. They have a dereference operation that we use to write into them, they have an increment operation that we use to advance to the stream. They notably don't have a quality because output iterator is right alone, right? There's, there's no way for me to detect the ends of output streams, which is scary in some sense. It makes it hard to program reliably when you can't verify that the size of your output range is big enough to hold the number of things you're going to stick into it. Uh, the example here I have for this is an outstream iterator, which is the complement of iStream iterator in C++. It lets me take a range of things and write them out into an output stream. So the interesting feature we have to cover is the domains of these operations. We've talked about the kinds of operations I can do on these types, but we don't know when I can do these operations on these types or what values it's legal to apply the operations to. So we're gonna talk about the domain of a function. The domain of a function is, it says right there, the set of values over which the function is defined. And the example I have here is a really simple function that takes an integer and divides 42 by that integer. 
something we've all seen before in math, and people probably know, what happens if I pass zero to this function? <coughs> we don't know, right? That's the problem. We don't know what happens. It's undefined behavior. Horrible things may happen. Nothing may happen. It may return seven. It may cause nasal demons to fly out of your nose. So zero is not a value that's in the domain of this function, although other integers are. And I'm talking about this because we want to talk about the domain of equality for iterators. When can I apply equals to a pair of iterators? For forward iterators, it's fairly simple. It's iterators that range over the same underlying sequence, right? Two iterators that point into the same range, I am allowed to compare with operator equals to see if they are the same. Forward iterators that point into different ranges, two different vectors, two different lists, a uh, list and a vector. I can't compare those kinds of iterators to each other, even if their types allow me to do so, because their values are not legally in the domain of that operation. Output iterators, what's the domain of equality? This is an easy question to answer. There is no spoon. Output iterators don't have a quality comparison, so I can never compare two output iterators for equality. I don't need to worry about it which leaves input iterators left as the last thing, right? How do I define the domain of equality for input iterators? This is how the C++ standard defines it with one of my favorite paragraphs of text in the inquire standard. The term the domain of equality is used in the ordinary mathematical sense to denote the set of values over which equality is required to be defined. This set can change over time. Each algorithm places additional requirements on the domain of equality for the iterator values it uses. These requirements can be inferred, I presume easily inferred, from the uses that algorithm makes of equals and not equals. For example, in case it's not clear, we have an example to clarify things. The call find abx is defined only if the value a has the property p defined as follows. b has property p and a value i has property p if at i equals x or if at i is not equal to x and plus plus i has property p. Okay, everybody understand? <laughs> right, the point I'm making here is in order to determine when it's legal for me to apply equality to an input iterator, I have to go look at all the algorithms in the standard library, figure out how they use input iterators, and, and determine, you know, I have to extrapolate from that behavior what my input iterator has to do if I want to implement an input iterator, or how my algorithm can use input iterators if I want to implement an algorithm. This is obviously kind of problematic because nobody has time to examine every algorithm in the standard, let alone every algorithm written by everybody who didn't contribute it to the standard. So the general rule we've come up with for input iterators and how they work is that there are essentially two values in an input range of iterators that we care about at any time that we can look at, right? There's the current value, that's the value I'm looking at in my algorithm, and there's the end iterator. And these are the two positions I know of, right? Current and end. And once I advance the current value of my input iterator to the next thing, I know that the old values are no longer in the domain of equality since input iterators are single pass, right? So at any given time, I know about the current position and the end position and no other positions in an input range. So we've got these five iterator categories that we've described. We're gonna move on, we're gonna talk about how they get affected by the Palo Alto TR. The Palo Alto TR was when a bunch of people on the C++ standards committee got together at Palo Alto to talk about how we could apply concepts to C++ without going through the fiasco, once again, of concepts when they tried to apply them during the C++ 0x, right? You may not all know this, but there was a thing called concepts and they did have them in the standard and they were applying them throughout the standard library, and we gave up in 2009 and said, you know what, we're doing this wrong. We have 120 different concepts defined in the C++ standard working paper. Something's not right here. The implementations don't work. We've screwed up. We, we have to give up on this because we don't know how to finish this for C++ 11. So they yanked all that out. And many people were upset, so they got together and said, okay, let's look at just a small part and figure out how we can define concepts to constrain the iterators and algorithms in the STL, just the iterators and algorithms, and do it with as few concepts as possible and still have strong semantics. 
this is a great thing because concepts let us replace tables in the standard that most people don't go look at with actual syntax in the program that the compiler can verify. This is awesome, but I've been talking about concepts now for several minutes. Some of you are asking, what's a concept? So we're gonna talk about that fairly briefly. Concepts come from the concepts technical specification for C++. A concept is a predicate over some set of parameters. It's usually a set of requirements that are applied to those parameters that they're expected to satisfy. And if the parameters satisfy those requirements, they're considered to satisfy the concept. If they don't, they're considered not to satisfy the concept. Um, syntactic requirements as applied by the concepts TS, I like to think of as being requirements on types. For example, I can say auto foo equals bar, and that's the kind of syntactic thing that the concepts TS can validate. I can validate that it's possible for me to take a bar of some type T and make a copy of it with copy syntax. It lets me constrain associated types that have to exist for a type or expressions that need to be valid. Now these concepts as they're used in the ranges TS are a, a slightly different kind of idea. We take the syntactic concepts and we say, you know, syntax is great, but syntax needs to have semantics to mean anything. So we apply syntax, semantic requirements, I'm sorry, as well, which I consider to be requirements on values as opposed to requirements on types. You know, the concepts TS lets me say, this thing has to have copy construction syntax, but I need to be able to say that the result of the copy is actually equal to the original thing, because that's what copying means, right? We, get, we have to have meaning for our syntax to be useful. Now the Palo Alto TR authors, they looked through the algorithms and got their, they developed their concepts by seeing how the algorithms used iterators. They didn't do it by saying, you know, here's every kind of iterator we know about, let's try to figure out how to classify them and group them together. They said, here's every kind of algorithm we have. What do these algorithms need? What operations do they use? And they developed the concepts from uh, above, I guess, instead of below. Some of the algorithms, they noticed, take unpaired input iterators. And they said, you know what? These kinds of iterators don't need an equality, comp equality operation because they're never compared for equality. You know, if you have an unpaired iterator, there's nothing for you to compare it with. It's uh, ridiculous to require these kinds of iterators to have an equality operation that can't ever be used. And the examples I have here for these are the three-legged double range algorithms like equal, first one, last one, first two, where the length of the second range is implicitly the same as the range of the, f of the length of the first range. Uh, the other one is iterator plus count algorithms like copy in, where I copy everything from first until I have copied count things and then I stop. That range has a, a specified length instead of a specified end. And they said, okay, if I don't need equality and inequality operations for these kinds of iterators, I, I can define a new category, right? We'll define a new category, we'll call it weak input iterator. It's a little weaker than the regular input iterator concept because it doesn't have an equality operation. Uh, moving forward into the ranges TS. We decided we wanted a range TS because we want to have algorithms that take the range object kind of ranges as well as the range sequence kind of ranges for many, many reasons, right? It's nice to be able to have one handle on a thing instead of be, having to specify two distinct endpoints. It makes it hard to specify an incorrect range when you have a range object instead of when you have to pull a beginning and an end from somewhere and tell an algorithm to use these begin and end pairs. Right? I, I can get begins and ends from different ranges and pass them to algorithms and algorithms don't know about that because they assume, like I said earlier, that that reachability property exists, that they are actually denoting the same range. <coughs> so the range TS takes these range, range object algorithms that are implemented by just the same kind of technique that range base four uses, right? It turns the range objects into range sequences by applying begin and end to them and passes those range sequences to the existing range sequence algorithms. But of course, we also were concerned that, you know, the, 
this thing called output ranges that are denoted by just one iterator in most cases in the standard algorithms. And we're concerned that you can't match the lengths of input sequences with the output sequences to make sure that your outputs are big enough. And for other reasons, we, you know, we wanted to have actual physical output ranges as, as a thing. And we also wanted to have sentinels in the ranges TS, which you guys have heard about before if you've seen any of Eric Niebler's talks. If you haven't, sentinels are not X-Men hunting killer robots, which you may have learned in the movies. Sentinels are a new way to denote the range as sequences kinds of ranges that I'll detail later on. So if we want to have output ranges, we've got this problem that output iterators don't have an equality operation. So we can't pair them together and use them to denote output sequence range objects. So we renamed the output iterator concept that already existed in the C++ standard to weak output iterator. And we added a new strong output iterator concept that has equality and inequality. And now we're using the same weak versus strong relationship for output iterators as already exists for input iterators from the Palo Alto TS. This is really nice because it lets us have the same kinds of behavior for output iterators that we already had for the other iterators. But it also means that the five categories have become seven. All right, we're officially halfway through the haiku here. We've got two more iterator categories that weren't in standard C++, which means ranges, we now have 40% more categories. This looks great on a, on a marketing bullet because as C++ programmers, one of our primary jobs is to make small numbers bigger or to make big numbers smaller, right? We all do this every day. We know this is a good thing. Uh, we also decided that we needed to factor out the common, uh, commonality of the weak input and weak output iterator concept into a plain weak iterator concept and factor the commonality of input and output, the strong ones, into a plain iterator concept so that we have ways to handle those things and to specify things that expect a stronger iterator that has a quality or a weak iterator that doesn't need to have a quality but doesn't care if it's input or output. Unfortunately, this means that in the text of the ranges TS, the word iterators colloquially means things that satisfy weak iterator. This is extremely weird because other uses of terms colloquially in the standard like forward iterators or random access iterators means things that satisfy, satisfy this concept that has the same name. So it's bizarre that iterator means things that satisfy weak iterator and a source of confusion. Sentinels, I was talking about sentinels earlier. Where did these things come from? What are sentinels? Um, often ranges have a distinct value that denotes the end. Like with iStream iterators, we use the default constructed iStream iterator to mean end of the range. This works great and is useful, but the question arises, um, the compiler has to examine these things at runtime to determine whether the value I'm looking at has to, has to be the special end value. Why could I not use a distinct type instead of a distinct value to represent the end? And then the compiler will be able to tell at compile time that something is the end of the range because it has a different type. Uh, in order to realize that, we have the sentinel concept in the ranges TS. Sentinel is a relationship that exists between some type i that satisfies the iter iterator concept and another type s that satisfies regular. Regular meaning it behaves like the regular types in standard C++. They can be copied and moved and default constructed, compared for equality, compared for inequality. These are the, the operations that I can do on regular types. So the, a sentinel has to be a regular type. And of course, once I have this type i and s, I need a way to compare them to tell when I'm at the end of a range, so they have to also be a quality comparable, meaning I can compare them with equal to or not equal to. Of course, that's actually kind of complicated because what does it mean for me to compare two things that have different types? The Palo Alto report has an answer for this. It says, you know, we have this great definition of a cross type equality comparable concept. And the way cross type 
relations were designed in Palo Alto so that they could have mathematical soundness, is that cross-type relations require the same relation to be valid for each of the types individually and for their common type. What's common type? Uh, C is a common type of type T and type U if I can convert a type, an object T of type T to C, and if the, that conversion preserves the identity of values of T, which means that uh, the, converted t the converted value of T1 equals the converted value of T2 only if T1 equals T2 to start with, right? It doesn't map different things to the same value of the common type, and it doesn't map things that are equal in the original type to different values in the common type. And of course, the same requirement has to exist for U because I haven't said anything special about T or U. They have to be symmetric requirements for these two types. So an example of this is that int is a common type of int and short, right? We know we can convert ints to ints, and we know we convert shorts to ints, and that that conversion will preserve the value's identities. Similarly, um, long is also a common type of int and short, and so is long long. I can convert these things without losing value or identity. Int, trivially, is a common type of int and int. That's a nice thing, right? I can convert a type to itself. And more interestingly, standard string is a common type of care pointer and care pointer const. Right? Those things are both convertible to this other weird type. The idea here is that it makes sense to relate two kinds of different types of things to each other if I can embed them both into a common universe where they have the same meaning. And in the case of numbers, the same meaning we all know in some way implicitly means you know these things can all be converted to real numbers. So if I can convert them to real numbers and they convert to the same real number, they must in some sense be the same thing. There's a natural number and an integer and a rational number and a real number and a complex number called three. Right? We, we know that these things are all equal. We consider them to be the same thing, right? That this is all three because they all have a common type. Question. All right, the comment is that null pointers are, uh, I might have a null care pointer. Can I convert my null care pointer to a string? No, I can't, because that's not a, a value that's in the domain of the conversion. And the response I have to that is that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't satisfy the common type concept, because the vast majority of the values do satisfy this requirement. Vast majority is the wrong term. Not every value in the domain is required to have this property. I mean, not every value of the type, I should say, is required to have this property. The important thing for concepts is that the values we're looking at in any particular usage case are all within the domains of the operations that are required. So I can say that integers are divisible even though there is an integer value that I can't divide things by. Another question? Yes, that's true. You have broken my example, and that's why I shouldn't have added another example of something more interesting this morning before the talk. <laughs> yeah, the comment was that care pointer equality it compares the pointers, not the things that they're pointing at, so this is wrong, and Ben is correct. This is a terrible example. I apologize. Back to cross-type equality of comparable. Cross-type like relations, like I said, require the relation to hold for the individual types, and the relation has to hold for the values converted to the common type. And most importantly, the relation needs to be the same over the individual types as it is over the common type, in the sense that if the common types of, of if the common type converted value of a T is equal to the converted common type value of a U, 
and two different t values are equal, then the, pardon me, let me start over. If I have two different values of t <laughs> that are equal to each other, and the common type of this t value equals the common type of some u value, then the common type of that other t value has to be equal to the common type of that u value as well. The idea here is that the relationship needs to establish a correspondence between the values of t and the values of u, so that if two t's are equal and one of them compares equal to a u, then both of those t's have to compare equal to the u. Right? I'm establishing that the relationship needs to be transitive across types. This is a nice, really strong relationship that very closely establishes the belief we have in mathematical numbers, right? That three integer is the same as three double is the same as three rational, and that those have to be transitive across types as well. So going back to the sentinel concept, the sentinel concept requires this cross-type equality comp relationship to exist between the iterator type and the sentinel type. So they have to be transitive. They also have to be individually equality comparable, which means I can't have weak ranges that are denoted by weak iterators and a sentinel because they need to individually be equality comparable and weak iterators aren't individually equality comparable. Uh, this happens despite the fact that the algorithms don't use equality on single pass iterators, right? I, if I have a single pass iterator and a sentinel value, I'm not gonna compare that iterator to itself for equality. Here's an example algorithm, any of. Right, this takes an iterator and a sentinel and some kind of predicate, and as it loops through the range, it invokes the predicate on each of these input iterators. It doesn't ever need to compare the current position to itself because it knows it's equal. And since this is a single pass range, the only position I can look at in the range is the current position or the end. With sentinels, end is a different type than the, in, than the input iterator type. So that comparison uses the cross type equality. I never need to use the symmetric equality for the iterator types. I don't compare iterators with other iterators here. Of course, the concepts require those operations anyway because uh, it's a checkbox, right? I need to check off that checkbox to satisfy the cross-type equality comparable concept. So we end up requiring this operation that does one of two things. It's either useless because you're comparing something that you can prove is equal to itself anyway, or it has undefined behavior because you're screwed up and you're comparing two things that aren't in the domain of equality for input iterators. So we've got a foot gun here that isn't just a foot gun, but it's a required foot gun, right? You have to implement this thing that's either useless or dangerous. Uh, skip. So the idea here is that by establishing the common type between iterators and sentinels, they both abstractly are denoting positions, positions in a sequence of some kind. It's the, the common universe that I've embedded iterators and sentinels into here so that I can compare them with each other. And we have embodied this in the ranges TS with the recommendation that you know, the equality operation on sentinels must be, always be true, right? Because sentinels abstractly represent the end position of a sequence, all right? If you have two sentinels that you're comparing, they both must refer to the end and therefore they must both be equal. So we've been telling people, you know, don't bother to implement any kind of weird equality comparison operation. Just say, yes, true. If people compare two sentinels, they must be equal. They both abstractly represent end. So looking at this, um, I was confused by this fact that we're telling people that sentinels are always equal when sentinels can have state. You know, they're either predicates or positions, and I, it didn't, I don't understand how they could be both. So I, I had found enough material here that I decided to figure out how sentinels were really supposed to fit into the iterator model. I needed to throw out everything I already knew about ranges as uh, iterator pairs that we had in the standard, and that we needed to start over axiomatizing iterators and ranges just from the iterator sentinel model of denoting a range. You know, instead of saying a range is an iterator pair or 
an iterator in Sentinel. I wanted to just start over with only the iterator Sentinel abstraction and see if I could derive all the range properties that the standard says, hey, this is how forward iterators work. This is how random access iterators work. This is a, a nice side effect. It means I have to define the domains of the iterator and Sentinel operations, which is useful because we hadn't already specified what those were in the range TS. We had told people these things have to exist. We hadn't really made it clear when you could use them. You know, you can look at the algorithms and figure out, oh, I can use them the same way the algorithms do. But it would be nice if we had those explicitly specified. Uh, sadly enough, I'm not gonna cover the entire axiomatization here. I, I know you would all enjoy that, several hours of mathematical derivations. Who wouldn't think that was fun? But unfortunately, we don't have time for that. There's lots of cool things in there, like if IS denotes a range, then either I and S are equal, or plus plus IS denotes a range as well. Unfortunately, I ran into a problem with stateful sentinels when I was doing this. So here's a type S. Uh, this type has one, one member, it's an integer I, and it has an equality operation when compared with an int pointer. It says, uh, I'm, it returns true if and only if that int pointer points at something that's greater than or equal to my int member. Right, this is simple enough. This looks like some kind of a, a thresholding thing, right? And I, I'm, I'm trying to make a sentinel here, so I've got to give it the other kinds of equality it has to be symmetrical equality-wise. I can compare, compare an int pointer with an S. I can compare an S with an int pointer. I can compare S's with themselves, right? Remember I said we have to have this symmetrical equality operation that returns true. And of course, when I need to define the not equal overloads appropriately, they need to be opposite. So what happens if I try to use this S as a sentinel? If I have this particular range of integers, right? It has three integers in it, two, one, and three. Nice and straightforward. Well, uh, a plus one is not equal to, to S2 because a plus one denotes the value one, right? Which is obviously not greater than or equal to two. But a plus two is equal to S2 because three is greater than or equal to two. So the range denoted by a plus one and S2 is just a single integer one. Uh, a plus one is also not equal to S3 because one is not greater than or equal to three, but a plus two is equal to s3, because three, again, is greater than or equal to three. So the range a plus one, s3, is also exactly the same thing, right? It's just the integer one. So since I've established that a plus two equals both s2 and s3, and the cross tripe equality comparability concept tells me this equals two relationship is transitive, then, it must be the case that S2 equals S3, right? They both equal the same iterator, so they must both be equal to each other. And of course, this is true because we said that the equality relationship between sentinels is always true. So we're fine so far, right? Everything's consistent. Uh, however, A plus zero is also equal to S2 because A plus zero has the value two, two is greater than or equal to two, and therefore the range a plus zero S2 is an empty range, it has nothing in it. But since A plus zero equals S2, and uh, A plus zero equals S2, and I've already proven that A plus two equals S2 earlier on, it must be the case that they're equal to each other. So I've proven that A plus zero equals A plus two. These two different pointers into this same array must in fact be equal, even though they point at different things and have different addresses. This is obviously a contradiction and this fundamentally arises with uh, stateful ranges, I'm sorry, stateful sentinels, because of the cross type of quality comparable concept requires transitivity across types. Uh, it doesn't make sense in some way for me to say that sentinels always have to compare equal if sentinels are predicates and these predicates are allowed to have state. So even though S looks like a sentinel to me, it's not, it, it didn't satisfy the concepts there. I, I, there was a contradiction. So the problem here is, like I said, the sentinels are positions idea versus the idea that sentinels are predicates. They don't both make sense at the same time. Uh, we had two implementations and strangely enough, neither of the two implementations had stumbled across this issue or exploded or opened a black hole despite <coughs> the contradiction. So something must be going on that the algorithms aren't using this requirement that exists. 
I went back and examined the algorithms because, like I said earlier, that was a hint of foreshadowing, the algorithms don't use equal to or not equal to on single pass iterators. I said, okay, what do the algorithms do with sentinels? How do they use sentinels and how do they use sentinel, the sentinel iterator operations together? The algorithms care that equality for iterator and sentinel and inequality for iterators and sentinels all have the same domain, right? All four of these things should behave the same. They care about symmetry, that I equals S means the same thing as S equals I, and the same in the case of not equals. I, I don't want algorithm writers to have to care about which side of the operation they put which thing on. They also care about this complement requirement, that not equals has to have the opposite meaning of equal to. Right? This is straightforward. It's just one of the things that should be obvious, but nothing is ever obvious when you're defining requirements. We, we need to have our requirements be complete. And ideally, the requirements should meet our intuition so that we won't screw things up. The first three of these look a lot like they should be requirements in general for a quality comparison, right? There's nothing iterator or sentinel specific here. So conveniently enough, I said, you know what? We need to define a weaker kind of a quality comparison requirement than the cross-type equality comparable concept from the Palo Alto TR for iterators and sentinels. Enter weekly equality comparable. Weekly equality comparable, strangely enough, has exactly those three requirements that I stated on the last slide were needed, but weren't specific to iterators and sentinels. So I took this concept and factored it out, essentially, of the existing equality comparison concepts and, you, and refined this concept to make those. This is uh, kind of nasty in it, because in a sense, we're invoking a predicate using the syntax for equality comparison, which is nasty semantically, because it doesn't have all the semantics we expect when we see equal equal. Right? I've intentionally removed that transitivity across types. So I'm, I'm breaking your expectations. This is unfortunate, but it's necessary to preserve backwards compatibility with existing algorithms. Right, the existing algorithms use this syntax to compare iterators with sentinels, so it has to work. Nice consequence of this is that weak ranges are possible. Right? We already knew we could write weak ranges with uh, a single iterator where it's the length of that range is implicitly is it inferred from the length of another range in the operation or from an iterator and account. We know these weak ranges exist. It seems like you should be able to describe them with iterators and sentinels as well. Well, we can, if we further relax our sentinel concept, to not require the types to be individually equality comparable anymore, since that requirement was only there to satisfy the cross-type equality comparability requirement, right? It said the types had to be individually comparable as well. So now we don't need to satisfy that. We don't need to require the types to be individually comparable. So now I can change my definition of S here. I can specifically change its uh, self-equality comparison to do the same thing that we all would have expected if I hadn't told you that it was okay to return true for all sentinels. It says, you know what, look at the eyes. Return true if the eyes are the same. And now if we plug that into our other program, ta-da, everything magically works as we intuitively expected it to. The properties that were true before are true before, except that I can't use transitivity to say that S2 and S3 are equal, and therefore I can't derive the contradiction at the end. So now that we've done this, we can say, hey, if I don't need a quality comparison in general to satisfy the cross-type equality comparison for iterators and sentinels, then maybe I don't need these strong concepts at all. all right, I already said that the algorithms don't use a quality comparison on single pass ranges. So why don't we simply get rid of the strong variance? <laughs> we can get rid of the strong variance, and I can replace references to strong concept name with reference to weak concept name and satisfies the sentinel requirements, right? If, if it satisfies the sentinel requirements, then it's a quality comparable, which was the only difference that existed between these weak concepts and the strong concepts. Having done that, we can say, all right, if I don't have strong concepts, there's no need for me to distinguish between weak and strong ones. I can 
take my weak concepts and strip that weak prefix from the beginning of them and just use the shorter, simpler name. And ta-da, we've gone back through the rest of the haiku. We've converted seven iterator categories back into five by throwing two away and renaming two of them to the old names. And now I can say, hey, look, the ranges TS doesn't change the standard model of iterators all that much. We still have the same iterator categories. This is uh, nice from a teachability standpoint because it's always better to have fewer things to explain to people. But most importantly, writers of single pass iterators and sentinels don't any longer need to write this stupid equality comparison that always returns true or does something wrong that violates the requirements. We've turned undefined behavior into a compiler error, right? Now when people try to say, hey, does this input iterator equal this other input iterator that's a value I cached earlier mistakenly, they won't get undefined behavior. The compiler will say, hey, this input iterator type doesn't have an equality comparison operation. You, you've screwed up. This is uh, very sexy. But of course, it's not always true because there are lots of input iterators out there that have operator equal to defined for them, right? All the ones on the C++ standard, for example. So hopefully someday we'll get checked concept implementations that can check implementations and say, hey, you're using this operation that isn't required by your constraints. You've screwed up here so that the implementations will be able to know they can't use that equality, even if it does happen to exist in the types that a user ends up passing to the algorithm. Uh, the other nice thing, like I said, we've reduced the number of concepts. It's, uh, seven down to five again. We're C++ programmers. We like to make numbers bigger and make numbers smaller. And the best thing about it is that the word iterators now means things that satisfy the iterator concept again. Right? We don't have to say iterator means weak iterators and explain to people that that is intended, even though there's a concept called iterator, that iterators doesn't mean things that satisfy it. Now we can say, yes, iterators means things that satisfy the iterator concept. So the interesting takeaway here is, uh, I guess from a standpoint of uh, concept library design, you know, what did I learn here about this relationship? And the thing is that, uh, the, uh, obviously first off, concepts that don't fit exactly fit the usage requirements smell. Right? They should tell you that something is wrong. Obviously, we have to trade off the minimality of requirements with our perfect equational reasoning purity that we'd like to have things look nice and mathematical. But when you've got requirements for operations that nobody is using at all, something is definitely wrong. Uh, I also learned that, you know, again, deriving things from first principles is a great way to get clarity when something's wrong in the other design. You know, throw away your preconceptions and the things that you think you know and just start over. This was great because uh, for some reason I didn't see the inherent contradiction in the statements. Sentinels are always equal. Iterators are sometimes sentinels, but iterators are never always equal. <laughs> right? This it didn't even occur to me until I was literally typing up the slides for the talk. That was when I had this thought. And I, I should have realized immediately, you know, from these statements, there's a contradiction here somewhere. This doesn't make sense. Anyway, if people would like to learn more about the ranges TS, I obviously haven't covered everything or even a significant percentage thereof. This was just uh, something that I thought was an interesting design evolution from a, a, an error that we found in the design. You can go look at the ranges TS working paper. It's at that link. These slides will obviously be made available at some point, so you can go in there and click on that link. There are early design blogs that describe a lot of these low-level design features in excruciating detail that were, are interesting. I think, obviously, they were interesting enough to pull me into being an author of the Ranges TS with Eric that are available at ericneebler.com. There's my implementation of the Ranges TS that uses concepts and therefore needs a recent version of GCC that supports concepts to work. You can get that and play with it if you like, which is all sorts of fun. There's the implementation with C++11 concepts that are hideous, nasty balls of metaprogramming, which means that they're kind of hard to use and the error messages are interesting. In uh, Eric Niebler's Range V3 library, which lots of people have probably heard about before, you can grab that and use it. It supports a wider range of compilers, obviously, than mine, since mine requires concepts. There's uh, also a new implementation of Range V3 with 
workarounds to compile with MSVC, Visual C++, which is awesome. There were many changes made to the compiler and some changes made to the library to get this to work, even though Visual C++ doesn't fully support C++11 or C++14. One good way to get that library, if you want to play with it in Visual C++, is using VC package. My buddy Robert promised me that he would cover for me the next time I want to go out and drink during the day if I put this slide in my talk. So those of you that happen to use Visual C++, this is an incredibly handy way to get a hold of libraries and install things with one command and never again have to tell Visual Studio where your libraries are or where their headers are or even which of your libraries you happen to want to use with a given project. And that's everything I had to say. So if there are comments, questions, people want to point and laugh, this would be a good time to do that. Question. Yes, if we had a sentinel that returns, I'm sorry, the comment is, if we had a, defined a sentinel that always returns true for every iterator, this sentinel says it's true for every iterator, then we would find an inconsistently immediately. And the response to that is, yes, that would be a terrible implementation of a sentinel. Uh, actually, no, it's... Uh, the comment is that we don't need stateful sentinels to, to discover the bug that I said I discovered. And that's true to an extent, except that that sentinel design violates other requirements as well, I think. The common is that we could go ahead and use name functions and have them default to the behavior of invoking what the iterators would do. I don't have a detailed response for that. Uh, obviously, customization points are an incredibly complicated problem that we have to deal with at length in the ranges TS because we want to have constrained customization points that have actual semantics to them, unlike the ones in the C++ standard. And in order to implement those, we have to somehow avoid invoking the customization points with the same names and namespace stood. It's very problematic and been the topic of lots of work, but we think we have at least a solution for. Well, I found when I played with ranges that for some algorithms, I was used to, a, I was used to some, for example, reverse requires by direct and right? But in the case of ranges, that's not enough because the sentinel range can turn to an infinite range and there's no place to start the reverse. So it requires more than a bidirectional sentinel. What are your thoughts on that? All right, the comment is that it's confusing to use some algorithms that expect a range to be denoted by two iterators with a range that's denoted by an iterator and a sentinel. The example given was reverse. You know, how do I reverse a range that starts with an iterator and ends with a sentinel when I don't know what the and I don't have an iterator for the end of that range? Especially when if that range might be infinite, it might take me forever to find the end of that range to be able to start reversing it. And the response is, I don't have a good answer to that right now. That I, I don't see. We haven't quite got a handle on infinite ranges yet and how to incorporate them into the standard. I'm getting closer. A lot of the newer wording says things like iterator and sentinel denote a range instead of saying reachability, which once you remove the reachability requirement uh, allows for the possibility of infinite ranges. Yes, comment, please, Dmar. I would like to comment on that, that is if you have a sentinel, it is not a bidirectional iterator. So actually if you have something denoted by a bidirectional iterator and a sentinel, you do not get a bidirectional uh, a range, you get only a forward range. 
The comment is that something denoted by a bidirectional iterator and a sentinel is not a bidirectional range, it's a forward range. And I would argue that in some sense, that's a matter of definition, right? How do we define a range? And I define a range, a, a, a foo range, as being something with foo iterators, regardless of what the characteristics of the end delimiter are. And that's obviously kind of fudging a little bit. In some sense, uh, a, an iterator sentinel range has two different subranges that we know about, right? There's the begin iterator, and there's the end sentinel, and then there's another point somewhere in between here, which is the highest iterator I've ever seen, right? So that when I write algorithms, they start traversing from the iterator, and when I get to here, I have this subrange that I know a begin and iter iterator for that I can traverse using whatever the traversal properties of my iterator category are, right? I can move around in here bidirectionally or randomly, depending on if I have bidirectional or random access iterators. And then I have this other subrange here, the iterator sentinel subrange, that I can really only traverse forward until I find the sentinel. So that uh, makes it interesting to implement good range algorithms because Iterator sentinel algorithms, you want to be single pass and forward only in some kind of sense. So yes, it's complicated to write a reverse that's efficient for an iterator sentinel range because you need an end to be able to reverse things. And you have to find an end if you don't have an end iterator. Is that all? So the question, sorry, I don't, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I thought you were pretty much done. <laughs> the question is, uh, why don't we you make ranges be the, the fundamental thing, right? Why don't we build up range algorithms that use ranges as an indivisible kind of entity instead of having iterators and saying, you know, that ranges are just a proxy for iterators. And the best response I have for that is to say that positions exist, right? When we, we have, when we have ranges, they often refer to data structures or regions of memory, and those things exist, and they have positions within them to denote the different places. And if we try to throw out positions, there are certain things that become harder to express. You know, what does find return is the big question. If you look at the D standard library, D ranges are fundamental to D's range library. You'll see that it has several different flavors of find. And there's one that returns the range from the beginning of the range you give it to the thing it found, and one that returns from the thing it found until the end of the range, and one that returns both different subranges, I think, and several different variations thereof. And it's all because that D doesn't really have a, a concept of position. It can't just say, you know, here's this position in the range you gave me where I found the thing. So I think that combined with the fact that we have lots and lots of old code using the position notion means that our range notion and our position-based notion need to continue to interoperate. Oh, my session is over, so I won't be taking any more questions. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>